New York Law School professor Emerita Nadine Strassen is the past president of the American Civil Liberties Union from 1991 to 2008, uh, is a leading expert and frequent speaker uh, and media commentator on constitutional law and civil liberties. And her books include Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship, and Free Speech, What Everyone Needs to Know. And that book is due out from Oxford University Press in October. Uh, Nadine Strassen, welcome to the Diet Soap podcast, and thanks for coming on. I'm so happy to be here, Doug. Thanks for having me as a guest. Yeah, and before we started recording, um, we were talking about how this channel is uh, mostly focused on Marxist politics and socialism. And I wanted to start with a question uh, that would be aimed at, at the question of, of socialism and Marxism, um, which is uh, basically it's this question. Why is free speech? Uh, so important for people uh, who are seeking to create political change? I'm so happy you asked me that question, Doug, because free speech, as we were also talking about beforehand, is important for everybody, no matter who you are and no matter what you believe. Freedom of speech is an essential element, not only of your own fulfillment as an individual, your own individual liberty, uh, but also for advancing whatever goals you support as a public policy matter. In recent years, though, certainly continuing to the present, people to the left of center, including many self-described socialists, have cast aspersions upon free speech and said that it basically just perpetuates the status quo and enhances the power of those who already have economic, political, and cultural power. I think nothing could be further from the truth. It is precisely to give voice to those who lack majoritarian power and hence are underrepresented in the political branches of government. It is precisely to give voice to those political or other kinds of minority groups that the Bill of Rights was added to our Constitution, starting with the First Amendment and its free speech guarantee. Um, by definition, those who are advocating minority perspectives don't have control of the political branches of government, so they can't depend on uh, officials who are accountable to majorities to protect their free speech. They have to depend on the constitutional guarantee under the First Amendment. And this is borne out by history. You know, when you mentioned socialists, I was thinking that one of the founders of the ACLU, Eugene Debs, was longtime head of the Socialist Party in this country, uh, who famously uh, was a presidential candidate while he was serving a prison term. And do people know what he was in prison for? He was in prison for simply peacefully, in the most tepid, understated terms, criticizing United States participation in World War I and defending rights of those who were uh, protesting the war, many of whom were, 15,000 of whom were also in jail uh, for that reason. And throughout our history, until the Supreme Court started strongly protecting free speech in the middle of the 20th century, um, the power to censor was constantly used against people on the left, including anarchists, socialists, communists, pacifists, um, those who were advocating rights of labor, abolitionists, women suffragists, and so forth. So what political changes took place in the middle of the 20th century that changed the nature of the Supreme Court protection offered to speak? It, it's a really interesting dynamic, which also gives lie to this too pervasive myth that somehow we have to choose between freedom of speech and political change and, and human rights because it was the confluence of the civil rights movement and support for free speech that really propelled the Supreme Court to overturn 
uh, the old decisions that had allowed Eugene Debs to be uh, imprisoned merely for expressing views critical of current government policies, uh, to completely turn that around. Positions that had been dissents in the early 20th century were unanimously adopted by the modern Supreme Court. And in most of the leading free speech cases of the second half of the 20th century, Doug, almost all of them arose out of the civil rights movement. Because just as I asked the question about Eugene Debs, why was he in prison? Everybody knows, or most people know, that Martin Luther King wrote an historic letter from the Birmingham jail. Most people don't know why he was imprisoned in the 1960s, decades after Eugene Debs. And it was for trying to exercise what we now consider to be probably the core most fundamental free speech rights in our democratic republic, and that is the right to peacefully protest government policies. In those days, it was Jim Crow, discriminatory, uh, racist policies. So the Supreme Court, under the leadership of Chief Justice Earl Warren, was very supportive of both the civil rights movement and free speech, and those two series of cases and values went hand in hand. And and the same continues to be true today. It is anybody who advocates any social, political, or cultural change, anybody who espouses a minority perspective, um, anybody who is criticizing the powers that be is going to especially depend upon a robust free speech guarantee. So you are a constitutional uh, law scholar um, and uh, and you were former head of the ACLU, the former president. What led you to study constitutional law and why did free speech become such an important topic for you? I have believed innately in human rights uh, as far back as I can remember, Doug long before I had the terminology, let alone any knowledge that there was uh, a source of law that could protect what I consider to be inherent human rights. And much more importantly, the founders of our country, uh, as stated in the Declaration of Independence, did believe that these rights are inherent in all human beings. They were obviously flawed in their Um, creation of a government that clearly did not respect the human rights of too many of us, but at least as a matter of ideal and aspiration. Uh, They subscribe to this enlightenment view of inherent human rights, which is also reflected in international human rights law. And I think that's an instinctive idea that that many of us have, even as, as very young children. I certainly did. And when I learned that there is not only a source of legal protection, but organizations that advocate for seeking to translate those aspirational ideals and promises into real rights, I was thrilled. I went to law school and uh, I, throughout law school, did volunteer work on behalf of human rights organizations and causes and continued have continued to do that throughout my career. Um, what would you say to people on the left, people who are socialists or Marxists, who would claim that the, the constitutional protections we're afforded don't create true conditions for free speech because of the amount of corporate control that there is over the media and that um, who would be skeptical of of the notion of the marketplace of ideas and freedom uh, of speech uh, being obtainable um, simply by removing restrictions to speech. Uh, Wow. There are at least four or five important questions packed into that one. So Mm -hmm. I'll start, Doug, but then maybe you can ask follow-up questions. Okay. To unpack, really excellent, but uh, but very complex. Uh, so uh, the first point that your excellent question raises is something I completely agree with, and to the best of my knowledge, no constitutional rights advocate would disagree, which is that the constitutional rights 
First of all, they are, again, ideals that are honored in the breach every single day, right? And that's why we have organizations like the ACLU and countless others that are calling government officials to account, holding them to actually live up to these ideals. Yesterday, uh, the day before this interview is being recorded, was the 60th anniversary of Martin Luther King's uh, historic I Have a Dream speech, and he had that wonderful line which I'm only going to paraphrase about how the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence, all of these founding documents were a promissory note, a contract that America had not lived up to, you know, and he said, all that we're doing is asking you to actually live up to those words that you set down on paper. So that's, that's point number one. We can never take for granted. Uh, In fact, James Madison, who was the principal author of both the Constitution and the Bill of Rights said that these are mere parchment barriers between actual rights and liberty and government oppression. They're words that are only worth the paper they're written on unless or until people and organizations take steps to implement them. Secondly, uh, a second really important point that you made is that the constitutional rights are written essentially in negative terms limits on government power rather than affirmative promises of equal entitlement to certain social goods, including human rights. Uh, and I would say that that is a first step. These thou shalt nots in the Constitution, including Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. That is a necessary but not sufficient condition for meaningful exercise and enjoyment of constitutional rights by every member of our society. And I certainly uh, strongly endorse additional steps to make sure that everybody has an equal and fair shot at realizing these rights. Let me take an example that is even more dramatic than the right to free speech, and that is the right to life itself. Barbarously, in my opinion, our country still has the death penalty, um, and every study has shown that a major, if not the major factor in determining who gets to live and who gets to die is not the severity of the crime, is not the past criminal record, but over an overwhelmingly important factor is how uh, how many resources the person has available to hire the best lawyers, the best investigators, the best experts. And I say that not at all disparaging uh, hardworking public defenders, but they have, you know, overcrowded dockets and under-resourced in terms of the experts and uh, other tools accessible to them. So even the right to life itself is proportionate to how many resources you have. The same is true for freedom of speech. The more education you have, the more technology you have, the more effectively and meaningfully are you going to be able to exercise your free speech rights. So what do we do about this? We don't, the answer is not to level down, you know, take away free speech rights from those who have more resources, you know, take away defenses against the death penalty from those who have more resources but rather to level up. And I'm always in favor of, uh, of doing that in every possible way. Um, now, another point you make is about whether um, certain corporate forces should have free speech rights. Uh, yeah, you didn't ask the question quite that uh, bluntly, but a lot of people do. And a lot of people Uh, purport to paraphrase Supreme Court decisions in Citizens United and other controversial campaign finance cases by saying disparagingly, oh, corporations aren't people, therefore they should have no free speech rights. Well, we have to be a little bit careful about that. First of all, um, so many of the important free speech rights have been won for everybody in cases where a major player 
was a corporation. I was talking about major cases for free speech arising out of the civil rights movement. One that is familiar to many people is the 1964 decision in New York Times versus Sullivan. The New York Times was a named plaintiff in that case, but also involved were many relatively poor uh, uh, civil rights leaders, including ministers and, and others in the South. Uh, basically, they had taken out an ad in the New York Times in order to complain about abuses against civil rights demonstrators in the South and seeking to raise money for their cause. Both they and the New York Times were subject to punitive de defamation uh, judgments by the courts in Alabama. And th there were parallel lawsuits that were being brought throughout the South with a specific intent to bankrupt not only the civil rights organizations, but at least as importantly, the national media that were trying to bring information about their cause to a national audience to generate support for the then pending 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, and so, you know, when the Supreme Court said you can't have these um, right. automatic defamation judgments with huge punitive damages for every trivial inaccuracy in a uh, in a something that's published, that was an enormous victory, not only for media corporations such as the New York Times, but also for impoverished ministers and civil rights advocates. And beyond that, speaking of civil rights, the very first case in which the Supreme Court upheld free speech rights for corporations was a case going back to the 1940s involving the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, a corporation. And the Supreme Court said that freedom of speech, in, in or, and this goes back to another point that you made, Doug, in order for it to be meaningful and not just theoretical, we have to give people the right to speak anonymously when they're talking about controversial topics. And we also have to give them the right to band together with other people to amplify their voices on controversial issues, which they would not dare address, you know, in their own individual identity. And the classic example it gave was people joining the NAACP in the South to fight against Jim Crow when you would be subject to all kinds of retributive measures, maybe even including threats on your physical safety and life and certainly on your job if you identified. So it's very complicated. And, and one other point, uh, because labor unions are every single law that protects the right of both for-profit and pro non-profit corporations to spend money to uh, advocate for or against candidates or political issues. Every single one of those laws also applies to labor unions. So if we want to take away the rights from corporations, we've got to start drawing some lines and coming up with some rationales. You know, the ACLU is a corporation. Planned Parenthood is a corporation. Uh, so is the National Rifle Association and anti-abortion groups. Um, and media corporations can include um, even very small-scale community newspapers. Uh, do we want to deprive them of the right to spend money to advocate for causes? So it's, I'm sorry to go on and on, but it's a much more complicated issue than the, you know, uh, than the slogans make it out to be. It's true, corporations are not people, but they are composed of people and help to give voice to people, often including people and perspectives that would not otherwise meaningful, meaningfully exercise their free speech rights. Yeah, I mean, as someone who is an independent publisher, we publish books as well mm -hmm. as create videos, um, and we have a, an online magazine. Uh, you know, we're an LLC. Right. And uh, if we if if we have to have the right to free speech as a business, as a kind of corporation, or else we don't have the right to free speech, we wouldn't be able to publish these books and 
unfortunately, you know, I live in a capitalist society. I'd love to transform it into socialism or communism, which I don't think of as uh, some state run mm-hmm. system. Right. But but uh, at the moment, you know, the way to produce text and uh, and speech to, for people for a wide, you know, a mass audience it is to form a business and to try to make money so you can keep doing it. If you just uh, if if the, if everyone had free speech rights except for when they formed a business, then you could just talk to one another, maybe on social media, the state run social media, but probably not. Or, you know, just to your neighbors and in a very that's, limited way. That's such a good point. And Citizens United itself was an organization that it was a political organization that opposed Hillary Clinton as a political candidate, which I know many people on the left do as well, I assume. But I actually don't know. I assume it was a critique coming from the right. Uh, and what they wanted to put out was a they had a video that was highly critical of Hillary. And it was that uh, that was going to be subject to restriction under the so-called campaign finance law. So it could be, you know, I think if people understand, when you use a slogan like campaign finance reform, that sounds really good. But I have to warn people, Patriot Act, many people also sounds very good or the communications decency act and not coincidentally uh, politicians are very clever about slapping an appealing name on a piece of legislation and it takes a lot more than a few words as our complicated explanations illustrate to show hey wait a minute you know don't be lured by the label. Look at what is actually being done and what the long range implications are, including for speech that you very much support. You know, I have some questions written down. I sent you already that are kind of um, uh, remedial and they, they kind of walk through some of the just fundamental principles around free speech. And I think it's worth going through those. Um, but I, I want to, before we, you know, tackle questions like what kinds of speech is, speech is protected and which, what kind of speech is actually illegal under the U.S. Constitution and those kinds of questions. I want to ask you a question that has to do with this particular historical moment, uh, which is coming after some major revelations um, that happened at the beginning of the year uh, because uh, Elon Musk released a bunch of files from Twitter and there was reporting about the... Um, uh, network of NGOs and security agencies uh, attempts and successful attempts to censor social media and the, and the major media. And um, I, I just want to ask you, uh, what did you make of the, those revelations and, and the others that followed? There were articles in The Intercept and uh, a, a, a journalist named Jacob Siegel wrote uh, about this well in, in a publication called Tablet. Um, what what do you make of this historical moment? and do you see uh, this as a, mom- a moment where the constitutional protections that we thought we could enjoy are under threat in a, in a unique way? Or how, how do you see these revelations? Doug, since you mentioned Tablet, let me say that Tablet magazine had approached me. I lose track of time, but quite a while ago, I to write an essay on exactly the same theme decrying the conspiracy and collusion between numerous government agencies and social media platforms to take down uh, what they described as disinformation or misinformation about important issues, including uh, issues about the election. And so let me back up into a, a, so I'm very, I was, I'm very glad that this issue is receiving more attention, that more information is being provided through both the Twitter files and more recently the so-called Facebook files and congressional hearings on point. But let me back up and give the pertinent constitutional principles. So the Constitution, including the First Amendment free speech guarantee, only restrains government, right? The First Amendment says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. And that the word Congress has been interpreted to extend to all government officials at all levels of government and all branches of government. 
but it does not extend to private sector actors. So just as you on your wonderful podcast have no obligation to provide a platform to anybody and everybody, and thank you very much for exercising your editorial discretion to invite me, the same thing is true for Facebook and Twitter and so forth. However, if government has a sufficiently close relationship with private sector actors that ostensibly private sector decisions about deplatforming some speaker or suppressing uh, or shadow banning some idea turns out to have been unduly influenced by government, that becomes a First Amendment issue. Government may not do an end run around its own First Amendment obligations by delegating its sensorial power to private sector actors through coercion or through collusion or through conspiracy. And make no mistake about it, every single expression that was taken down about the elections, about COVID, about other controversial matters that were disclosed in the Twitter files and the Facebook files, all of those involved constitutionally protected speech. It clearly would have violated the First Amendment if the government had directly, um, let's say, expressly ordered Twitter to take down uh, certain expression on pain, on, on express pain of some penalty. But what we saw was the government was making, if not express threats, veiled threats and insinuations and implications. And fortunately, First Amendment law is very, is not formalistic. It's very practical and functional. And the inquiry that the court asks is, as a practical matter, if you're uh, an executive with Twitter or Facebook and you're receiving these communications from the government, are you going to reasonably perceive that as an implied threat that you better do this or else? Or else we're going to revoke your Section 230 immunity or else we're going to subject you to an antitrust uh, remedy or investigation, or else we're going to haul you before Congress yet again and subject you to detailed investigation and so forth. So I think people can disagree at this stage of the litigation. It was just a preliminary ruling on the judge's part saying, well, there's enough evidence has been brought forward that the case can proceed. But as more and more evidence is gathered, it's a very fact-specific question because it is permissible and it should be permissible for government officials to exercise their own free speech rights and to try to persuade the social media companies to take down certain information. Government officials have the right to encourage or urge social media companies to take down certain expression. What they may not do is coerce. And that is not a bright line distinction, right? It's a matter of judgment when the communications cross the line from permitted discussion, persuasion, advocacy, encouragement to impermissible collusion, threats, intimidation, and conspiracy. Well, in the case of um, the Twitter files and the Facebook files, and specifically around the election and, and the pandemic, those two mm -hmm. topics. There are moments where I think uh, politicians directly express threats. Elizabeth Warren, for example, said, you know, if, if something isn't done about the disinformation on Facebook, we're going to revoke 230 or, you know, something like that. And however, the way in which um, the, these major uh, tech companies, social media companies dominates the uh the, the speech online it has become so centralized um when combined with the way in which they are reliant upon, upon the state uh to maintain their business model just without even any threats being issued they they, they know that the, they rely upon certain laws and certain agreements in order to continue um it seems to me to create conditions where state censorship is almost 
structurally built in to the, the, the internet environment that you, that, and when you allow, uh, the, uh, FBI or the, uh, Department of Homeland Security or the CDC to be, to issue guidance to these institutions, uh, to these social media companies on what should be encouraged or discouraged or what should be moderated and what shouldn't be, um, you're almost, it, it, I, I feel like there's some an entwinement that happens where these <laughs> um, corporations are are no longer really in, independent of the state. Um, and, and I don't know if you use that word entwinement uh, deliberately, Doug, but that is literally one of the two terms that the Supreme Court right. uses, constitutional oh. law terms of art, uh, to describe the inter the prohibited relationship between government and private sector companies that crosses the line and creates a First Amendment problem. Uh, sometimes they call it entwinement. Sometimes they call it entanglement. Mm -hmm. And I, I think certainly as a matter of principle, I hope everybody would recognize that at some point, even if it is a formally an action, a sensorial or speech suppressive action by the private right. sector company, at some point, government involvement is so close and interrelated that you have to treat it and recognize it as a practical matter as government censorship. So I'm really happy to hear you sympathetic to that point of view and the evidence that's come forward to show that we are at that point. Government mm -hmm. has crossed that line because, again, the Democrats and most liberals have been completely disparaging of the Twitter files, of the Facebook files, of the decision by the judge that, that you, you referenced in Missouri versus Biden. I think because of a politically result-oriented perspective. You know, Missouri is represented by a, a Republican attorney general, and Biden is the, you know, the tribune of the Democratic Party. Uh, but make no mistake about it, if whoever is elected, including Donald Trump, is going to use the exact same tactics, but uh, to pressure the social media companies just to take down different expression. Indeed, some of these programs did begin under the Trump administration. So I wish that people would look behind the immediate you know, winners and losers in the political context and, um, and, and really look at the very important principles that, that you are raising, that this is such a, it, it, it's, a, it's structurally a way for government to get away with censorship that it could not carry out directly on its own. And this is, as you say, all but directly on its own. The School of Materialist Research is a self-sustainable platform where ideas are discussed in ways that would not be possible in conventional academia. The school is defined by its interest in the materialist approach to knowledge. Among its faculty are Julia Kristeva, Amanda Beach, Ben Woodward, Thomas Nail, and Paul Cockshot. The deadline for applications is September 11th. Check out the link to the School of Materialist Research in the description for this video. Your question, I guess I have around, because you said, and this is a defense that, um, the Biden administration would make, I think that they, that the state has the right to, uh, to, a, to speech, to urge, um, publishers, whether it's a newspaper or a book publisher or a movie, uh, company, uh, a production studio, they have the right to urge certain ideas to be prominent and others to be suppressed. Right. They, they have yes. the right to say, listen, uh, we shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't be making a film that's saying that the body is, uh, the disease comes from humors in the body, but rather, you know, really it's a germ theory that should be prominent, right? They have the right to say that. And, but, but I wonder if the first amendment, which says that Congress should pass no laws to restrict speech, it might also want to say it should also, the government can create no institutions with the aim of restricting speech. Um, like if you have a disinformation governance board, yes, exactly. You know, yes. then, uh, or, or if you have, uh, an organization within the department of Homeland security, like CISA, which is mm -hmm. aimed at, uh, con uh, controlling and protecting mm -hmm. all of the communications infrastructure in the country. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're charged with the digital side of that. 
then at what point have you gone beyond just making a law, but actually created an institution for the systematic uh, censorship of, of the I think that's, private sphere? I think that's a very important point, and especially when one considers that these institutions, uh, let's be honing in on DHS, Department of Homeland Security, uh, it was established in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks specifically to protect us against foreign terrorist threats, threats of foreign violent terrorist acts. And it seems like the most complete perversion of that mission, or you could say the most amazing expansion of that mission to engage in surveillance and suppression of communications among people in this country about individual health and public health. Um, again, I have to say, you know, I am a person of the left. I'm a, a, a liberal, not a, not a socialist. Uh, but most of my tribe um, is not complaining about what you and I have been talking about, Doug. Most of the complaints are coming from the right. And it's just a complete inversion of what in decades ago was the left that was critiquing the national security state and its um, uh, unwarranted incursions into the domestic sphere and into individual civil liberties and civil rights. Yeah, you are the former president of the ACLU. And I, I have not followed this closely. You probably will understand this much better than I do. But it seems to me that even the ACLU has changed its perspective on the question of free speech a bit. Is Am I overstating the case or do you think the ACLU's character has changed in recent years? Uh, you are uh, somewhat overstating the case, but I'm not going to blame you because that's what the media tends to cover is when there's a critique that the ACLU isn't doing as much as it should. Uh, that said, I, you know, the, the ACLU certainly continues to be criticized for doing too much uh, to defend very controversial speech. So, for example, uh, the most famous and in many views infamous case the ACLU ever handled in ever, but it involved free speech, was the so-called Skokie case from Skokie, Illinois in the late 1970s when we came to the defense of a group of neo-Nazis to peacefully demonstrate in Skokie, Illinois, a Chicago town, a suburb that had a large population of Jewish people, many of whom were Holocaust survivors. Uh, we easily won that case in the courts of law because it involved what's been called the bedrock principle of free speech, viewpoint neutrality. No matter how loathed a viewpoint might be, including a Nazi viewpoint, that alone is not a justification for suppressing it. You can only suppress it if you can show that in the particular factual circumstances, it will uh, immediately instigate a direct and serious harm, such as intentional incitement to imminent violence. Um, we came to the defense of another group of fascist right-wingers, uh, uh, white supremacists, uh, in 2017 in Charlottesville, Virginia, where the ACLU defended the free speech rights of the Unite the Right demonstrators in that uh, situation. And believe me, I and the ACLU have been subject to a lot of criticism for that, um, illogically, uh, but understandably with the emotions that that are in play people have blamed the aclu for the tragic murder of heather Heyer and the uh, dem counter demonstrator who was run down by oh. an automobile uh, and other people were run down um by uh, and injured um so I, I can get into the facts of that if if you want but the the point is that the aclu has continued to Staunchly defend freedom of speech, even for the speech that we hate, because it could not be more antithetical to our own civil liberties ideals. Uh, but some people are complaining that the ACLU is not spending as much time on free speech issues, that it's devoting more resources to other issues. And uh, I, I don't know. I don't think that that's true. But uh, let me tell you where I do think that there is a problem or a challenge 
And it's not only for the ACLU dog, but it's for all institutions that traditionally have been especially strong supporters of free speech. Uh, and that challenge is that the younger cohorts, including the younger staff people, do not have the same really rock solid commitment to free speech that older people such as yours truly have. And I'm talking about academia, I'm talking about journalism, publishing, theater, the arts, entertainment, and libraries, and yes, human rights and civil liberties organizations. And this is not just a matter of anecdotal observation. Many surveys have been done within a number of these institutions that consistently show that the older the cohorts are, the more strongly supportive they are of free speech, including for that core viewpoint neutrality principle. And the younger the cohorts, the less supportive they are. Why, do, why is that the case, do you think? What, what, what is it about the young people today that they get it so wrong? I feel like such an old fogey because that was the line that was used against my generation in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, then against mine. I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer, so I'm in the <laughs> older cohort uh, now. Um, so those old fogies were, were getting it wrong. Uh, I think that the best series of hypotheses uh, to explain this phenomenon were in The Coddling of the American Mind, a book that was co-authored by Jonathan Haidt, a social psychologist at NYU, and Greg Lukianov, the chief executive of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. And the factors that they mentioned were, uh, I, I think the ones that resonated the most with me, were uh, an overprotective tendency on the part of both parents and schools uh, so they, the term helicopter parenting summarizes what was going on, is still going on with parents and schools that um, commendably were teaching students against uh, to resist and uh, bullying that both have gone so far that they have been overprotective. Uh, and both John and Greg write as parents of young kids themselves, and they say, we understand that you don't want to see your kids subject to anything that's hurtful, even if it's an idea that's upsetting. It has a, a, a negative impact on the kid, and you want to protect them. But in fact, if you really care about their mental and even physical well-being, you have to expose them to a little bit of risk, including being exposed to ideas that can be very upsetting. Otherwise, they're never going to be able to, to cope in the adult world where they're inevitably going to be subject to um, hurtful ideas. Um, another factor that they mention, and this is particularly strong for uh, John Haidt, who continues to do a lot of research, is the impact of social media, especially uh, on adolescent girls, which is highly associated with very dramatic increases in rates of anxiety and depression and suicidal ideation and even actual suicide, uh, that there's this fear of missing out, um, there's increasing isolation and um, failure to interact in the real world, which gives people experience with encountering those who have different ideas and different backgrounds and learning to work out disagreements on their own. There's the over-bureaucratization of both schools and universities so that uh, rather, again, rather than students working things out on their own, they, uh, there's just this institutional framework in place that encourages them to report uh, to some official or some office or some agency that is going to take action to protect them and on campus. We saw a dramatic shift from until very recently it was students who were fighting against the administration for more free speech rights. But in recent decades, it's students going to the administration saying, please protect us against this speech that we consider dangerous and harmful. Yeah, I remember about 10 years ago now, there was a big controversy 
and it went viral online around Halloween costumes at Harvard. I think it was Harvard. Yeah, where, it was at Yale. It was at Yale. Yale. Uh, Yale. Um, and uh, yeah, the 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 dean was was made. To, he had to resign because he said they put out an email saying, "Listen, we think students should be able to decide for themselves what they wear as a Halloween costume without." The, the university stepping in to give guidance on that. You're adults it was, now. It was, yeah, it was Erica Christakis, who is herself a distinguished child psychologist. So she was speaking as an expert uh, who has committed her entire professional career to uh, protecting the mental and emotional well-being and health of young people. And so it was not just from the perspective of, well, it's good for a free speech point of view, but that is actually good in terms of the very goals that are asserted as a justification for suppressing speech, namely the mental and emotional health of our young people, reducing anxiety and depression, that actually Experts, including John Hyde and Erica Christakis and many others, are saying censorship is worse for their mental health, even if you didn't care about the free speech concerns. Just their well-being is suffering from the overprotection, the shielding against ideas that they find upsetting or harmful. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I've read a lot of the social psychology uh, writing on this, Doug, uh, and becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that words are not innately harmful or hurtful. How they affect you depends on countless factors, including what's in your own mind. Uh, in my book about hate speech, thank you for mentioning it, mm. um, one of the people I quote is one of my human rights heroes, Eleanor Roosevelt. And um, this is a paraphrase, but pretty close. She said, nobody can hurt you unless you give them permission to do it. In other words, you can choose to regard the person who's trying to insult you and stigmatize you as an idiot or an evil person, but it sh you should not allow it. You should not give that person the power to tear you down. You've got your own inner strength and inner resources. And um mm -hmm experts in psychology say that the best thing that we can do is to uh, encourage and develop habits of mind so that people can be resilient against ideas that they find um, hurtful or harmful and better yet to engage with them because you can always learn something, including the ability to um, critique the idea and to perhaps persuade other people from adopting the idea. That's why I advocate, and, and not only me, but much more importantly, the United States Supreme Court has said that the remedy to ideas that you dislike is not viewpoint-based censorship, you know, but rather more speech, counter speech, persuasion, refutation. And there have been so many case studies, very powerful, even of confirmed white supremacists and other hate mongers and extremists who have been weaned away from those ideas, never because they've been punished, never because they've been stigmatized, ostracized, shamed, and shunned, but always because of persuasion. And, and persuasion is even too strong a statement. Um, because I've read many accounts of former hate mongers who write about what it is that uh, led them to question their own views. And it's always that kind of uh, sympathetic approach. Somebody who reaches out to them with compassion for them as a human being, not compassion for their ideas, and engages them in questioning their own ideas. So it's not a heavy-handed indoctrination. Right. Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm not always that great at, at being as compassionate as I should be when I try to persuade someone on the other side of an argument, especially not on Twitter. But I, I do take that up as a good, a good approach. Um, you've, your book uh, uh, about hate speech um, argues that, in fact, and you've been making that argument right now as well, that censorship is not the best way to combat hate speech. And I do um, 
since I've become very focused on free speech, I mean, I've always been a free speech absolutist. I've always it's been very important to me. It's one of the reasons I'm on the left is because of, I don't know, some inner need to to have the freedom to express myself and uh, and have others express themselves. But um, since I've been really focused on it, I've had people within the left milieu say to me, uh, listen, what about hate speech? What about, like, for instance, um, uh, you know, Twitter uh, was supposedly going to be a, a, a realm where free expression was permitted. It's not any longer. But, um, but it, you know, people were saying, well, listen, now the N-word's being bandied about on, on Twitter. Um, or it, to take the Yale example, do we really want to allow these students to dress up in blackface for Halloween? Um, what would you say to those people who think, yeah, in fact, I would like to have an outside authority impose limits on the speech that I find to be hateful. And I think that if we don't, we're going to be living in a society where hate becomes normalized and hate and blackface is, is acceptable again. And what, what would you say to them? Speech definitely can be harmful. There is absolutely no doubt about it. I completely agree with the United States Supreme Court when it said the re protect speech, not be despite the fact that it has power to do great harm, but precisely because of that fact, speech is powerful and it is a power to do great and good as well as great harm. Now, if there is a tight and direct causal connection between the speech and immediate harm, then the speech can be punished uh, and should be punished. So I gave one example, intentional incitement of imminent violent or lawless conduct. That's mm, likely wow. to happen imminently. Often hate speech will satisfy that standard. Another example that hate speech often satisfies, including in the Charlottesville situation, um, the ACLU came to the defense of the uh, Unite the Right demonstrators in advance when the city council in Charlottesville sought to uh, retract, revoke the permit that had already been given for their demonstration, not because of any threatened violence, but rather because of the odiousness of their viewpoint. And you had the police chief and Charlottesville saying, oh, there's no problem with violence. We've got it under control. Um, as a so the viewpoint is not a justification for suppressing the speech. And so people can understand it. Not too long ago in Virginia, it was Martin Luther King's viewpoint that was deemed to be offensive and mm, parade right. permits were being denied for that reason. So that's the danger of empowering the government to decide what speech is sufficiently hateful, right? One person's mm, yeah. hate speech is somebody else's pro-human rights speech. Uh, but, you know, uh, the very the day before the big rally in Charlottesville, uh, a group of white supremacists started marching on a group of counter demonstrators who were ringed around the statue of Thomas Jefferson on campus. And they were uh, chanting odious words. You will not replace us. Jews will not replace us. Well, those odious viewpoints are not a justification for suppressing the speech. But when you put it in the overall context that they were marching toward and confronting the counter demonstrators at menacingly close distance and brandishing lighted tiki torches, that's what the law recognizes as a true threat. When the speaker is directly targeting one or a small group of people and um, engaging in expression or expressive conduct that intends to instill a reasonable fear on the part of the targeted individuals that they're going to be subject to violence. It's a very fact-specific um, uh, assessment, but I think it's undebatable that mm -hmm. the facts in Charlottesville satisfied that. So that was another example of hate speech that in context could and should be punished. But when you get beyond that tight and direct causal connection between speech and imminent harm, yeah. and you give the government more latitude to punish speech because it might indirectly at some future point lead to some harmful conduct, that is exactly what empowers the government to engage in viewpoint discrimination. 
Before the Supreme Court adopted that speech protective standard, again, it was done in the uh, middle, second half of the 20th century in the context of the civil rights movement. Until that point, the Supreme Court enforced the so-called bad tendency standard, that speech that has a tendency to potentially perhaps at some indefinite future point contribute to some harm. Well, if, you know, there's almost no speech that doesn't satisfy that standard. And so it basically gives complete subjective discretion to the enforcer to decide which speech satisfies that loose standard. And that's why consistently it was speech that was advocating social and political change, advocating on behalf of minority groups and minority perspectives that was deemed to be dangerous and was subject to suppression. And we hear that even today, Doug, when you hear people sling around, including government officials, sling around terms, uh, disparaging terms for speech they dislike, you know, that it's hate speech, that it's disinformation, that it's extremist or terrorist speech. We've had government officials say Black Lives Matter has been attacked by politicians and government officials as hate speech, hate speech against white people and against police officers. Um, it's been attacked as uh, disinformation. A couple of government officials have said, oh, it's, oh you're going to like this, that it's not really about civil rights. It's about Marxism. And so it's disinformation. Um, and we've had other government officials say it's terrorist speech and it's extremist speech. So the bottom line is, yes, even speech that is not subject to uh, restriction under the First Amendment because it doesn't have a sufficiently tight and immediate connection to harm. Speech that doesn't satisfy that standard still can bring about harm. I recognize that. But that is less dangerous, less harmful than empowering the government with subjective discretion to decide which speech is sufficiently indirectly harmful that it can be punished because that predictably is going to stifle voices in the minority and dissent. And that is poisonous, not only to values of liberty and equality, but also to values of democracy. Yeah. Well, you, um, in the, in the past, even used Nazi Germany as an example of why censorship is not uh, helpful in protecting against hateful ideologies um and I, i'm just going to ask you if you could walk me through that now like I is it the case that if there had been more restrictions of the speech of nazis before hitler rose to power that that would have stopped the nazi rise or 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 not that's a really important argument. It's often made, and those of us who uh, disagree with it strongly, including many historians, call it the Weimar fallacy, that um, if only the Weimar Republic during which Hitler rose to power had suppressed hate speech, we could have averted the rise of Hitler and genocide and the Holocaust. And let me say, uh, as the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, I have particular abhorrence for Nazism and uh, anything that would actually have been effective to stop the rise of Hitler, I think, could be justified, including restrictions on free speech. Because um, let me so state here another First Amendment principle, Doug. Many people who oppose free speech have this distorted version, you know, that they think that free speech is completely absolute under the First Amendment. Not so. Uh, as I've already said, if the speech has a sufficiently tight and direct connection to harm, the speech may be punished. Another way that the Supreme Court describes that uh, is what's called strict scrutiny. The court will closely look at the speech restriction and ask if it's necessary to promote a countervailing goal of compelling importance and effective in doing that. So if restricting Nazi speech had been necessary and effective in um, preventing the rise of Nazis to power, the censorship would have been justified even under strict First Amendment standards. 
However, we have historical a historical record that's that sadly but predictably shows the opposite. In the Weimar Republic, Germany already had very strong laws against hate speech, which were very strictly enforced. Leading Jewish organizations at the time said that these laws were fairly enforced. The prosecutors were bringing cases against many of the Nazis, including on Uli Streicher, the publisher of Der Stürmer, a rapidly anti-Semitic publication. Uh, they served jail terms, and obviously that did not stop the Nazis from propagating their ideas. To the contrary, they used these trials as propaganda platforms that garnered them attention that they otherwise would not have received and sympathy they otherwise would not have received. The problem was not the speech by the Nazis. The problem was the violence by the Nazis, which stopped other people from speaking and from organizing against them. The Nazi thugs got away with assaults and murders against not only Jews, but also communist socialists, um, uh, um, racial, uh, other racial minorities, uh, the Roma, gay people. Um, uh, members of the military, their political opponents. And so the analogy would be if during the civil rights movement, the United States had made no effort to punish those who killed Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders. Mm -hmm. wow. um, okay, well, I have one final question for you. We've been talking for about an hour and I appreciate your time today, but um, and it's a personal question, so I'm going to ask you for your indulgence. But I was thrown off Twitter. <laughs> and, and I was thrown off Twitter for what they said was violent speech. And what, what happened was uh, someone was criticizing uh, a television show called Rising, and it's also an, an Internet show, for platforming RFK Jr. and allowing him to spread misinformation on the channel. They were saying, I, I can't believe she did this. Obviously, she's. Uh, Brianna Joy Gray has become a right winger, um, letting this guy have a platform is up beyond the pale. And I tweeted back and I said, how is this even allowed? RFK Jr. should be shot. Now, I was saying that they were being extremist and that it was absurd that they would not want to. And I had been arguing with this person for a long while saying, you know, we have to protect the free speech of even those we think might be wrong. The misinformation is no reason to do that. But it was deemed violent speech, and and, and this is indulgence. To, but but obviously, if, if the intent is sarcastic, that doesn't rise to the level of a direct threat, right? I just wanted to. You're exactly right. I mean, if the government had censored you, that clearly would have been unconstitutional under a number of Supreme Court precedents where the Supreme Court has said, especially when you're talking about uh, matters of public policy, that speech is entitled to the highest protection, including the right to engage in hyperbole, rhetorical hyperbole. Uh, and, and one of the cases involved, uh, it was during the Vietnam War era and the draft, and an African-American draftee mm. said, uh, if in a public gathering, if they ever put a rifle in my hands, the first person I'm going to shoot is uh, LBJ, right. Lyndon Baines Johnson, the then president of the United States. And he was actually convicted of threatening the president and the Supreme Court overturned that, I think, unanimously, but with right. a very strong opinion saying, you know, nobody could take understand that as conveying anything other than his political viewpoint. Um, I can give you other examples as well. One involving the civil rights movement where uh, one of the Evers brothers uh, was um, chastising black people in um, Alabama for, I think it was Alabama, sorry. Um, doesn't matter where it was, but in, in, in a state where, in a city where there were um, racially discriminatory stores, so they had, or businesses, they had, NAACP had organized a boycott against those stores and ever said, you know, if we catch any of you violating that boycott, we're going to break your damn neck. And there actually was some violence that was committed thereafter against some people who were breaking the boycott. And the Supreme Court said, no, there was not, you know, there was too much time had, had intersected between the time uh, that he made those remarks. And those remarks were just political hyperbole. You could not blame his remarks for violence that happened to occur afterwards. So 
Um, that kind of rhetoric clearly is constitutionally protected and is distinguished from a punishable true threat, which I defined earlier, but let me recap it and tie it to your situation, Doug, where first of all, the speech has to be targeted to a particular individual or group of individuals. The speaker has to intend or recklessly uh, instill a fear, a reasonable fear on the part of the directly targeted person or persons that they will be subject to violent or lawless conduct. And by saying it's a reasonable fear, that means it's an objective standard. So if the person who's targeted is really thin-skinned and unreasonably frightened, that's not enough. Uh, it has to be what a reasonable person in that position take this as a credible um, a, um, announcement, declaration that you are going to carry out violence. And by the way, the speaker doesn't have to intend to actually carry out the violence, but the speaker does have to intend to instill a reasonable fear because the law does wisely recognize that, you know, the mere, if I have a reasonable fear, that's going to be enough to deter me from exercising my free speech rights or my freedom of movement. It doesn't matter whether you intend to actually carry it out. But there's no, I don't think there's even a plausible argument that your speech rose to that standard for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. But that gets us back to the point that Twitter is not the government and it can have greater restrictions um, than the government itself does. But, you know, especially in the context of RFK, I think that everything has become so politicized and um, if you're saying anything that could arguably be seen as supporting his free speech rights on Twitter, then some others it's guilt by association, right? Mm -hmm. the problem with some of these so-called content moderation approaches. Yeah. Yeah. I think what happened was that, um, someone who doesn't like my stance on free speech, trying to protect it, used that tweet as a, as a justification to report me to Twitter and then get me offended and was successful because sarcasm is not picked up by ai you mm -hmm. know that that but um thank you for that uh um uh I, i'm planning maybe in the future to make a, a little documentary no budget film called elon and me where i <laughs> see if i can go and talk to Elon about this um but uh yeah i really appreciate you coming on the uh podcast today i hope that people um uh who are on the left are persuaded to be more concerned about the free speech issue Due to our conversation, is there anything I didn't ask you or that was on that list of questions to which I had? The questions were just great, Doug. And we could, you know, I think the to me, the conversation was interesting. I hope it was to you and, and even more importantly to your audience. I was looking for a flyer for my book, which I don't have here, but um the new book, which is coming out in October, I can send you a flyer with a 30% discount code for anybody who buys oh. it as a result of listening to this so-called author event, which makes it cost only $13, which I think is pretty cheap these days. Mm -hmm. um, and it's called Free Speech, What Everyone Needs to Know. It's in question and answer format, very user-friendly. And the more information people have about free speech, the more supportive they tend to become. So that's why I really wanted to write this book. It's sort of like a free speech for dummies, but uh, for people who aren't dummies. Yeah, no, I will um, definitely put a link to that in the description and I will mention it. Um, I'll re record an introduction and mention it at the beginning of the podcast as well. And um, Nadine, thank you very much. I'm going to end the recording right now. Um, If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.